Welcome to the Symposium on Variability. My name is Igor Mikhailovich from the Joseph Stefan Institute, and together with Professor Michael Tipton of the University of Portsmouth, we are extremely grateful to the UK Physiological Society for supporting us in the organization of this meeting, and particularly to Ms. Rosie Heinart for all of her efforts. We are also grateful to the European Space Agency and the Energy Institute for their support. Variability is ubiquitous, and researchers often choose to ignore it, hide it, or delete it. Outliers are frequently removed from data sets, and variability is hidden or ignored by use of summary statistics, such as mean and mode. One of the first to comment on mishandling of data was Charles Babbage, the inventor of the first mechanical computer. In his book published in 1830, titled Reflections of the Decline of Science in England and on Some of Its Causes, Charles Babbage comments on the practice of trimming, which according to him, and I quote, consists of clipping off little bits here and there from those observations which differ most in excess from the mean and in sticking them onto those which are too small, end quote. We all realize that humans, other animals, and engineering systems exhibit a wide range of individual responses to different stressors. The problem is how to deal with such variability. Can such data be analyzed only qualitatively or can we harness statistical approaches to analyze it quantitatively? This is the aim of the symposium. Our colleagues will present examples of variability in different fields of research with a particular emphasis on the variability they see in their data and how they deal with it. I should mention that the impetus for this meeting stems also from discussions held with Jonathan Scott of the European Astronaut Center regarding the individual variability observed in the physiological responses to bed rest. This is an experimental model used to study the effects of adaptation of physiological systems to inactivity and unloading of weight-bearing limbs as experienced by astronauts in space. These adaptations include among others, loss of muscle and bone mass and cardiovascular deconditioning and so forth. The large variability observed in some of these responses may in future favor recruitment of astronauts, which would be more resilient to such adaptations. Such individual variability comprises genotypic and phenotypic components. These will not only affect the process of deconditioning, which we observe in space, but also the responses to exercise and training. In competitive sports, it is the outliers that will likely be most successful, or at least more successful than those that aren't responding appropriately to, to the same training stimulus. <clears throat> Athletic training now includes adaptation to hypoxia to potentially improve performance and to heat to minimize the decrement in performance during competitions in hot climates. The process of acclimatization to stressors such as hypoxia and heat, whether individual or combined, is also quite variable among individuals. The variability in the responses to hypoxia are perhaps more appreciated, particularly when some, for example, can climb Mount Everest without supplemental oxygen and others cannot, even with supplemental oxygen. Among the many physiological limitations posed during high altitude expedition is the problem of cold. Although this is principally an ergonomics problem of providing sufficient insulation and proper equipment, there are many cases of cold injury during expeditions. <clears throat> some might be a consequence of equipment failure, but many occur due to factors rendering some individuals more predisposed to the risk of cold injury than others. These issues and more will be the focus of today's presentations. Tomorrow, the meeting will continue with examples of variability in clinical and industrial settings. The present coronavirus pandemic has impacted significantly on our global society. The consequences of being infected by the coronavirus can be fatal for some, while others are symptomless. An understanding of this variability is fundamental to understanding and controlling this virus. One of the main symptoms of the virus is, of course, severe hypoxia, which is again variable in its intensity and may lead to other devastating consequences of the disease. Pharmaceutical research is now focused on developing a vaccine against the coronavirus. Human trials play a major part in bringing a vaccine to market. The impact of individual variability on this development was exemplified by the headlines of about a month ago when the pharmaceutical firm AstraZeneca announced that it was suspending work in this development. The reason was that among the tens of thousands of test subjects, one exhibited unexplained side effects. Work on the development of the vaccine has subsequently resumed, but this is an example how unexplained variability becomes a barrier to drug development. 
Workers in a variety of industrial fields are exposed to extreme environments on a daily basis. Global warming is not only exaggerating the exposures to heat in some industries, but subjecting workers to heat stress in industries that until now were not considered as thermally stressful. In contrast to athletes, alpinists, astronauts, and so forth, workers are not. This might require an investment in heat stress mitigating strategies in industry and also a better understanding of the individual variability in the responses to industrial environments. Variability also has a crucial role in other aspects of industry where it can be the enemy of quality control. How do those producing a products ensure consistency or lack of variation in their product? The issue of variability in industrial environments and in engineering systems is of much interest to the UK Energy Institute who is also supporting this meeting. These will be the topics discussed tomorrow. The meeting will conclude with a session during which statisticians and mathematicians will provide recommendations regarding research design and analytical methods that allow researchers to better understand, interpret, and learn from the variation in their data. We hope you enjoy the presentations. Each session will be followed by a short comfort break during which you can pose questions, which should be entered via the question and answer fu function at the bottom of your screen. Should your question be similar to the one posed by another attendee, you can simply like that question rather than repeating it, which will then provide the question with a greater weighting and give it a higher priority. We have also decided that any statistical questions will be logged and transferred to the specialist final session tomorrow. This session will have a 40 minute question and answer period during which statisticians and mathematicians will address the statistical questions posed on both days. Upon completion of the proceedings on both days, you will be provided with the opportunity to join a networking session. Should you wish to join the session, please, can, please click on the link at, uh, on the chat uh, screen you will see. You will then be transferred to the session and be assigned to small breakout rooms. During these breakout sessions, you can discuss issues brought up during the meeting and more importantly, provide feedback to the entire group. Comments regarding the meeting can be offered on social media using hashtag variability. Finally, the presentations will be available to those that have registered for the meeting. I would like now to now go to the first session on exercise and training. Uh, the first presentation titled Individual Variability in Human Performance Under Various Stressors, The Interplay of Genes and Environment is authored by Maria Koskulu, Panayotis Miliotis, Alexandros Soteridis, and Vasilis Klisuras. The paper will be presented by Professor Koskulu. Please. Thank you, Professor Majewik, for the introduction. I would also like to thank all the organizers for setting up such an interesting online symposium and for the invitation to present at this meeting. Next slide, please. Uh, the complex interplay of genes and environment of nature and nurture has been a concern since very early among philosophers and scientists. Next, please. Hippocrates, in his well-known aphorisms expressing his concerns and advice about the proper exercise, he connected the proportion of exercise, nurture, to the constitution of the individual, nature, as well as to the season of the year, environmental conditions. Next, please. The term nature, nurture, was introduced by Sir Francis Galton in 1876 in one of his classical papers, where we find the notion there is no escape from the conclusion that nature prevails enormously over nurture. Next, please. There is mounting scientific evidence showing that Galton's arguments on the preponderance of nature on phenotypic variation applies equally well in the case of Olympic athletes. Is the Olympic athlete born or bred? A holistic approach in the answer to this question could be that superior performers are endowed with a high genetic potential for their sport, actualized through hard and prodigious effort. There are also epigenetic factors which may influence the traditional diet of genes and environment and the human spirit through cognitive processes and behavior can be as important as physiology. It can exert, exert a substantial influence uh, and push the ultimate limits 
of human performance even further. Next, please. Hard training, laborious effort, contributes greatly to high performance within the limits set by heredity. The Greek pre-Socratic philosopher and poet Hesiod recognized the value of hard work, stating that in front of superiority, the immortal gods set sweat, and there is a long and steep way to reach superiority, rough at first. He was confirmed. We know now that the process of transforming genotypes into phenotypes does not occur instantly. It is not so simple or so quick. Next, please. Psychologist K.A. Erickson and his co-workers propose that experts are differentiated by their practice histories, not by their genes. They claim that the distinctive characteristics of exceptional performers are the result of adaptations to extended and intense practice that selectively activates norm dormant genes which are contained within all healthy individuals' DNA. Next, please. We may also add recent evidence by Montero and Lundby, depicted in this figure, which refutes the myth of non-response to exercise training. Apparently, non-responders do respond to higher dose of training. Indeed, an athlete would never realize his genetic potential without vigorous training. But based on a meta-analysis of 88 eligible studies, it seems that deliberate practice could explain only 18% of the variance in sporting performance. Next, please. Let's go to the heritability studies now. Most phenotypes related to high performers are normally distributed in the population. The relative power of genes and environment, the development of these, uh, uh, in the development of these performance phenotypes can be unraveled by using two genetic strategies, either the measured genotype approach of molecular analysis or the unmeasured genotype approach of quantitative analysis. A very powerful method in quantitative genetics is the twin model which is based on a comparison of phenotypic similarities between monozygotic and dizygotic twins. Next slide, please. Monozygotic twins share all of their nuclear DNA and therefore any, any intra-pair difference in a measurable trait must be due exclusively to environmental influences, whereas dizygotic twins share only 50% of their DNA and any difference observed between them in a specific trait must be attributed to both genes and environment. Based on such comparisons, we derive heritability estimates which express the amount of genetic contribution. The closer the heritability to unity, the stronger the genetic influence. In this early study by Vasilis Klisuras, an incredibly high heritability of 93% was obtained. Next, please. Next slide, please. A few years later, Claude Bouchard and his co-workers in a comprehensive study using both twin and non-twin brothers established that heredity is a major determinant of maximal aerobic power, but they reported a lower heritability accounting for about one half of the variation observed in VO2 max. Next, please. Next slide, please. The following three graphs are from the well-known heritage family study, as presented by Professor Bouchard during his inauguration as an honorary doctorate at the University of Athens five years ago. In that study, between family variances, in, in that study, between family variances were compared with within family variances and the similar heritability of 50% was again reported for VO2 max. We can see in this population of young sedentary adults that a substantial fraction have a relatively high VO2 max values and some of the subjects have a value of 55 ml per kilogram per minute, a value that can be attained even by many regular exercises. Next slide, please. 
when this population was trained for 12 for 20 weeks, the gain in VO2 max was 16 plus minus 9 percent, with a distribution of scores skewed in the direction of the high gainers. We see an extraordinary range of training responses, despite the fact that the program was fully standardized and supervised, and there was a perfect adherence to the training protocol. The heritability estimates for the trainability of U2 Max in this study was about 45%. Next slide, please. Importantly, there was no correlation between baseline intrinsic fitness level and its trainability. Next, please. One of the criticisms for the classic twin study method is that it fails to separate the variance attributable to non-shared and shared environmental effects. To get over this limitation, more recent studies have been applied to the twin and nuclear family data, the elaborate model of path genetic analysis. In this type of analysis, phenotypes of the twins are modeled as being determined by ad additive genetic effects, common or shared environmental effects, specific or non-shared environmental effects. Interaction of effects between co-twins could also be detected by using this model. Next slide, please. In addition to the heritability and trainability of U2 max, a subsequent heritability has been reported also for other traits related to sport performance, such as maximal anaerobic capacity, 83%, morphological characteristics in the muscle and the whole body, 70 to 92%, neuromuscular coordination, 84%, motor control and motor learning, 68 to 70%, personality traits and cognitive abilities, about 50%. Next, please. Julia Misidzi from our laboratory, using transcranial magnetic stimulation in monozygotic and dizygotic twin pairs, determined the genetic variation of plasticity in human motor cortex and found the heritability of 68%. Next, please. Human twin studies paved the way to detect changes related to elite sport performance with quantitative and molecular methods. The following have been identified so far as putative factors. The alpha actin in three gene is essential for the function of fast muscle fibers, so it is important for sprinters and power athletes. The variant two of the angiotensin converting enzyme gene seems to predominate in endurance athletes, while it's DD variant in sprinters. And the mutation in the gene which stops functional myostatin from being produced is important for weightlifters. Next slide, please. Epigenetic factors like environmental signals can modify the activation of certain genes by intervening in mechanisms like DNA methylation and histone modification, thus leading to changes in gene expression. Next slide, please. Epigenetic differences in genetically identical individuals have been demonstrated in several studies. In this one, we see differences in DNA methylation and histone acetylation in different tissue type types of monozygotic twins. In 65% of twins, epigenetic markers were similar within pairs, while in 35% of them, uh, differences were exhibited. Interestingly, young pairs were more similar than older pairs, and the greatest difference occurred with pairs of identical twins which lead with divergent lifestyles. Next slide, please. For a gifted athlete to become an Olympic winner, personality traits and the mind, which are conditioned by epigenetic influence, may be of paramount importance. In this respect, we here see a study on a pair of identical twins, both endurance athletes in 20 kilometer race walking, trained by the same coach for 19 years. 
the one was three times an Olympic winner, whereas his brother was slower by only about 5% and never won an Olympic medal. An assessment of their biological and behavioral profile revealed that intra-pair differences were negligible in physiological attributes related to endurance, but were divergent in personality traits such as anger control. The Olympic winner had an excessive control over his emotions and behavior. Next slide, please. It seems that to a big extent, an athlete's high achievement depends on what is happening inside his brain. Interactions of neural networks in the brain and modulation of corticospinal excitability can contribute to peak performance. The human mind can go beyond the information given by genes and some epigenetic function having to do with behavior of uh, surpassing the accepted barrier of performance is certainly needed. Next slide, please. Interesting studies using functional MRI revealed also that elite athletes and non-athletes use their brain differently. Experts activate the supplementary motor region, whereas novices activate the limbic regions, and this can lead to, can lead to catastrophic deterioration of skill and performance since input from the limbic structures can disturb activation of cortical motor programs. Next slide, please. Individual variability, however, is also evidence, evident, although very often underreported, when studying responses under various adverse environmental conditions. Acclimatization to environmental stressors, such as hypoxia, heat, microgravity, has been widely used both as an ergogenic aid to enhance performance and as a medical tool to preserve health. We keep seeing in the literature responders and non-responders to the expected hypoxia-induced erythropoiesis and the subsequent increase in VO2 max in older studies with altitude training, as in this classical one. Next slide, please. But also in more recent studies, uh, with normobaric and hypobaric hypoxia. The variability is still there. Next slide, please. We see profound individual variability in the heat-induced responses in view to max and exercise performance also after heat acclimation, as in this study. Next slide, please. And when two stressors are combined in a study, as is the case in the cross-adaptation study of Sotiridis et al., with hypoxia and heat, where the responses are rather puzzling, regardless of the subject's fitness level. Here are the responses of some trained individuals. Next slide, please. And here you see diverging responses of untrained individuals, again, all over the place. Next slide. And uh, inter individual variability in view to max deterioration has been observed in the classical Dallas bed red study by the late Ben Seltin and co-workers, as well as in the changes in view to max values observed 30 years later in the same subjects. Next slide, please. And when bed rest is combined with another stressor, hypoxia, as in the study by Keramidas et al., uh, varying responses appear again among individuals in VO2 max. Next slide, please. Finally, various responses in peak exercise oxygen uptake have been observed during and following long duration space flight in astronauts in, uh, at NASA, not in all cases attributable to the initial level of fitness. Next slide, please. As Claude Bouchard has put it, an enormous amount of research work is needed before we can predict the effects of an individual's genomic 
and perhaps epigenomic characteristics on the ability to be trained and reach elite athletic status in a, in a sport. Epigenetic alterations inevitably mold our DNA, silencing some genes and promoting the expression of others, thereby facilitating cognitive, emotional and behavioral changes that empower man to push performance beyond existing boundaries. Next slide, please. When, on top of the other factors affecting peak performance, environmental stressors exert their effect on challenging homeost homeostasis, does the individual variability in physiological response remain at the same level as before exposure to the new environment? Or is it increased? Or is it decreased in magnitude? Next slide, please. What are the prerequisites for superior performance at various environments? Who will be those individuals who will manage to enter the pedestal, the gate of the Olympic Stadium in ancient Libya? There is a lot we know, but still more that we don't know. Next slide, please. I would like to thank uh, you for your attention and my co-authors in this presentation, Panagiotis Miliotis, PhD student and uh, Alexander Sotirizidis, postdoctoral fellow in our laboratory, and of course, most of all, our mentor Vasilis Klisouras. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria, for that nice review and presentation. Uh, I would just like to mention that because, uh, now, because I forgot at the beginning, that all the Professor Koskalou and all her co authors are members or are affiliated with the National and Campodistrian University of Athens in Greece. Thanks, Maria. And uh, now I'd like to continue with the presentation on individual response to exercise training, obvious and elusive. The presentation will be given by Professor Anne Hexteden from Saarland University in Germany. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to give this talk. Um, next slide, please. Variability in training responses is really obvious. And I think that's something that sets variation in response to exercise training apart from, for example, pharmaceutical intervention that everyone experiences this. So if we start training together at a similar level, not all members of the group will progress the same way. Next, please. And of course, that's a starting point to ask why this is the case. And I think that's the subject matter researcher that we see on the left side that may be due to genetic differences. You have just heard about that uh, in extension. That may also be due to variations in the training performed, which is not standardized in this everyday life setting. And of course, it's also interesting for coaches or in the case of preventive and rehabilitative exercise for the attending doctors. So how can I predict or optimize the training response of my specific patient? Next, please. If we now move on to scientifically investigating this experience and perceived variation, then what we see in longitudinal trials is a vast variability in pre post changes that can be seen for virtually every outcome measure, not just for performance that can be directly experienced in everyday life. And again, of course, we ask ourselves, where does this variation come from? Is it nature? Is it nurture? And if so, what factors exactly in those two realms? Next, please. Next, please. Again, this is also a question of interest for the practice of sports and for the practice of medicine. And it's also something that should let us think about where does this variation come from, from a statistical perspective. This will be covered in depth tomorrow. I will nevertheless address this aspect briefly because it is really decisive for what we can know and what we do know about variability in training responses 
to scientific standards of proof. Next slide, please. What we see in a longitudinal trial, first of all, in the training group is observed variability of training responses, so cross response variability. And from this rather statistical perspective, it is important to note that this does not necessarily represent true differences between the subjects. In fact, the only certain component of cross response variability is random measurement error. So random intra individual variability in the individual pre and post measurements. If we manage to get rid of this part, for example, by subtracting variance in a control group, we plausibly get training induced variation. Next, please. This aspect of impact of random measurement error is generally taken into account today. What is less present is the potential of within subject variation in response to training. So it has seldom been investigated if the same subject would consistently respond if the intervention was repeated. So we know little about that, but what then remains is individual training response or in statistical terms, subject by training interaction. And that is, I would say, what is really of interest. So inter-individual differences in the true consistent training response. Next, please. And this, in fact, is the door opener to the more biological or practical perspectives on this variability. And I think that's a very important point, because if we are not really sure that there is true inter-individual difference in training response, then it makes little sense to look for predictors or determinants of individual response. And it also makes little sense to predict or potentially optimize it on the individual level. Next slide, please. So how can we get an estimate of how large this true inter-individual training response actually is? Of course, we have cross-response variability, so we need estimates of how much to subtract from it. Next, please. Next. So we need the reliability of our measurements, ideally over the right time frame. And ideally, we would need the reliability of the change scores devoid of measurement error. Next, please. And how far we can get on that, how far we can get on this way, in fact, depends on the design of the trial that has been conducted. Because this is very different from comparing means, right, if we really want to analyze the variability. If we just have an uncontrolled trial, next please. We have the magnitude and variability of the pre post differences. We can get a bit further if we have a reliability trial, perhaps within our own study, but basically that's it. If we have a randomized control trial, which is kind of the criterion standard for comparing the mean efficacy of a training intervention then we can calculate the difference between the variances in the training and in the control groups and that will be deepened tomorrow and it's plausibly an estimate of training induced variation to directly analyze subject by training interaction and following the mantra no repetition uh, no interaction, we would need a repetition of our intervention period after an adequate washout. 
this design is very extensive and has been very rarely conducted. Next, please. There are some workarounds that have been published, um, among them repeated testing during the duration of one uninterrupted uh, training period. I will come to that later. But repeated intervention trials or replicate crossover trials would clearly be warranted. However, next please. There are limitations which are in the case of the replicate crossover design due to the intervention study itself. So to in exercise training adaptation, which is adaptive and potentially not completely reversible. So we may not only have the risk of carryover, so an insufficient washout, but it may be discussed if there are not really lasting effects that would question the validity of this criterion standard research design in the case of exercise training. Of course, there are practical challenges like manifold trial duration and challenging data, data analysis. Next, please. As I have mentioned, repeated testing within one uninterrupted training period may be a practicable workaround approaching the validity of the re replicated crossover design. The idea behind this, next please. is to take the slope of the individual regression lines is instead of a pre-post difference as the response indicator and thereby get a more robust estimate of training response that allows for random error in individual measurements as well as on within subject variability on response. Next, please. The downside of this approach is the biological and statistical consequences of repeated testing. So every baseline is different. Training adaptation is not, re not necessarily linear. And also we may have um, limitations to the assumption of random errors. Next, please. This slide um, shows the estimates of uh, subject by training interaction as standard deviations from this uh, repeated testing uh, trial that has been published in the Journal of Applied Physiology. And we consciously applied different published methods to derive this standard deviation for the individual responses, which all stay above um, 20 percent of baseline variation. So we don't know for sure because the criterion standard trials have not been conducted so far and may not be possible. And it most probably depends, as you have heard, with more intense interventions, the variability seems to be lower. So this seems to depend on the kind of training intervention. But at least under certain relevant circumstances, subject by training interaction seems to be there and seems to be of relevant magnitude. So yes, it seems to be worth the trouble to really analyze this variability in training responses. Next slide, please. There are also other lines of evidence beyond analyzing variability in longitudinal training trials that point in the direction that there is relevant inter-individual variation in training responses, not just random variation. First, tradability seems to be a subject 
characteristic, a genetically determined subject characteristic, at least in part. You have heard about the twin and family studies. By the way, these two are my daughters. And there also have been animal breeding experiments that underline the genetic component in the responsiveness to exercise training. Some other plausibility considerations are that training adaptation is multifactorial. There have been several moderators uh, been described in the literature and so it's highly plausible that even if this is not an inherent subject characteristic that stable life conditions also impact on the magnitude of training response and contribute to a repeatable variation in training effects among people. And lastly, and that is really a consideration that is specific to exercise training, it's the limitations to the standardization of the training stimulus. There's um, the figure that you see on the down uh, right side of the slide is from a work of Shahar Rosenberger from 2010. And she showed that when training is standardized according to percent VO2 max, then other strain indicators differ vastly. Strain indicators that also contribute to the signaling cascades that finally lead to training adaptation. So the message from this is that it is very difficult to really get a standardized training stimulus. We have to decide which strain indicator to take. At least in preventive training studies, it's frequently a heart rate. And so we can't assume that the other relevant components of the training stimulus are the same. So that will also contribute to a variability and adaptation, at least plausibly. By the way, this variability um, in the fingerprint of the training stimulus has been confirmed in a replicated trial. So that is not just random variation, but that is really a replicable subject characteristic. Next slide, please. So again, yes, inter-individual variation in training response is real. And that means it seems to be possible to do better than the group mean when predicting uh, or targeting a specific training effect. And the aspects that fall under this are responder classification, of course, only when this variability as a subject characteristic does exist. Only in this case, it makes sense to classify responders, non-responders, high and low responders, and so forth. And only in this case, it makes sense to look for the biological and physiological underpinnings. So search for the moderators and mediators of training response. And from a practical perspective, try to predict an optimized response on the individual level. Next slide, please. But to go through this door and really realize those aims, we need control and repetition that we usually have on the level of the group, if we compare groups or try to predict group means, we need those two factors on the level of the individual. So what would have happened without the intervention for this specific individual or to separate inter and intra individual variation and quantify uncertainty. Next slide, please. Just a few words on the classification of individuals. Much has been written on this. 
So the uncertainty in the response estimate is always large and hard to, hardly calculable if we only have one pre-post difference. If we have a dichotomy, of course, we always lose a lot of information. Next slide, please. With respect to training responses, it's difficult to choose the appropriate threshold. So shall it be the threshold between what can be observed by pure chance or what is probably more than pure chance or shall it be related to a clinical relevance, which is something completely different? Next slide, please. The choice of the criterion parameter is also difficult. In most of the literature on individual training response, VO2 max has been the criterion parameter, but of course, this is not always the most relevant training response. No. Next slide. And lastly, there is the well-known mode and protocol dependence. So if we have an individual who responded or not to a certain intervention, we can't tell if it, he or she would have responded to a different training protocol. Next slide, please. Again, a suggestion from the repeated uh, testing uh, design. In this case, we have the, uh, the slope of the individual regression line as the response estimator, and we can calculate with certain reservation uh, confidence interval for these individual responses, which may provide some advantages in classification on the individual level, just with the same logic as we routinely do for group-based confidence intervals. Next slide, please. This is the last figure from the repeated uh, testing uh, publication. We chose a comparison of many approaches to the classification of responders and non-responders and highlights the high discrepancies between them. So among the subjects, 20 subjects in this trial, only 11 have been consistently classified by the published approaches. So only slightly more than half. This questions the attempt to classify individuals, or at least it calls for a um, standardized approach to it. Next slide, please. A case in point for uh, what I said about the need um, for repeated testing or repeated intervention on the individual level are several trials with um, a, a crossover design that analyze discordant response to different training modes, but without repeating the intervention. So, and what they describe is individuals that respond to endurance training, but uh, don't respond to endurance training, but respond to strength training in one case or to sprint interval training in the other case on this slide have been rescued. So there is a real difference in training response to different training modes, but according to what has been said, this can be inferred only with great reservation because it assumes that response to the same training mode would have been the same. And we just don't know if this is plausible, yes or no. Next slide. So for a personal summary, plausibly, Inter-individual variation in the response to exercise training does exist. Part of it is inherited. Part is due to modifiable moderators of training response. And of course, much of the observed variation is due to random variation. So yes, there is justification 
to pursue research in the direction of precision and personalized medicine approaches. Next, please. Specifics of research in this direction with respect to study design methodology and data analysis are established and fundamentally important to gain valid and replicable insights. And among those specifics, repetition is the key to separate trade from chance. And in this case, this means repetition on the level of analysis, so repetition on the level of the individual subjects. And strategical research questions from my perspective include the mode dependence of individual training response, the relevance of interactions between the known determinants and the magnitude of within subject variation because this decides the relevance of the specific research designs. Next, please. So a comprehensive biological understanding, a quantitative white box model of training response, next, is out of reach, at least for the foreseeable future, from my perspective. Next, please. So what we can do at the moment to analyze, predict, and potentially optimize individual training response is to realize at least a certain degree of repetition on the level of interest, consider main determinants, the main effect of which is known, integrating group-based information and critical thinking. So can we really, what can we gain from the paradigmatic group-based research design? And so as a final remark from my side, don't stop trying to advance out of fear to miss perfection, a common quote, which I would in this context change to, next please. Don't stop trying to be as good as possible, even if imperfection is certain. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you very much for that presentation. <laughs> that was wonderful. Uh, the next presentation is individual variability in the response to heat and hypoxic adaptation with particular reference to combined stressor approaches. The authors are Rebecca Rendell from Bournemouth University in U UK, Alexandra Sotridis from the National Cap Industry University of Athens in Greece, Joe Corbett and Michael Tipton from the University of Portsmouth and yours truly. Um, the presentation will be given by Dr. Rebecca Randall. Please, Rebecca. Thank you, Igor. Uh, so in this presentation, we'll examine the true individual variability in response to repeated heat stress alone and in combination with hypoxia. And I'll illustrate this with some data. Next slide, please. So there have been hundreds of physiological stressor studies, and we're now pretty, pretty familiar with the typical adaptive responses to repeated heat stress. We see reductions in temperature and heart rate, an increase in sweating and expansion of plasma volume. However, only a handful of these studies present the individual data of these responses and instead often show the group mean change. Having presented some individual data ourselves, we've begun to take a closer look um, and notice that the study methodology and variables measured were important. But in order to establish the true individual response, um, further analysis is required. Um, and this is to separate any random within subject variation from the true variability of response. And Professor Heck Simpson has just introduced some of this nicely at the beginning of her presentation. So to achieve this, the variability within the intervention should be compared with the variability with a cool control comparator group. And this can be done for heat acclimation alone, but also what hasn't been done before is examining the impact of a secondary stressor. So in this case, hypoxia combined with heat stress and how this might affect the true variability of the adaptive response to heat. Next slide, please. So this is an example of data published showing the group mean typical responses to heat acclimation, the reduced stretch temperature and mean skin temperature, reduced heart rate and increased whole body sweat rate. But what you'll notice um, is what appears to be some large variability in the change in these variables shown here with the standard deviation bars. Next slide, please. Now, when we look at published slides that show the individual data, 
we can see that there are pronounced individual differences. And so in this presentation, we sought to quantify these individual differences and account for biological variability. Next slide, please. So the aim of the study was to investigate the true individual variability of adaptation to heat alone and when combined with hypoxia. Next slide, please. So this study reanalyzed data from six uh, studies from two laboratories um, from Portsmouth and Slovenia. Um, and these studies had comparable methods with three 10 day interventions. The heat acclimation intervention used daily controlled hypothermia where rectal temperature was clamped at 38.5 degrees C um, through alter altering exercise intensity in the heat. The heat acclimation combined with hypoxia intervention included the same heat acclimation protocol um, with the addition of daily normal baric hypoxia and the control group completed daily cycling in a cooler environment. Before and after each intervention, key markers of heat acclimation, I've already mentioned, were measured in standard heat stress tests. Uh, now, what was new about this study is we used the Atkinson and Batterham calculation uh, to determine the true individual variability in response to heat alone and in combination with hypoxia, using the cool intervention as the control comparator. Next slide, please. So this slide describes the individual responses to heat acclimation alone and with hypoxia from each laboratory, with the traditional mean and standard deviation bars also shown. A shows the change in mean body temperature, B shows the change in heart rate, C shows the change in plasma volume, and D shows the change in whole body sweat rate. The red data points represent the change in response following heat acclimation alone. Blue is for heat acclimation combined with hypoxia, and gray represents the cool exercise control. So the red dots demonstrate the typical heat acclimation response, but what you notice is a large spread in the magnitude of response between individuals in response to heat. And this spread is also evident following combined heat and hypoxic stress with the blue dots. Importantly, there's also a spread of inter individual responses following the control in the gray. And if we factor this into our calculations, we can go some way to understanding the true individual variability in response to environmental stresses by accounting for biological variability. Next slide, please. So this figure compares the original standard deviation of the um, group response to each of the three interventions, plus the newly calculated standard deviation of response uh, to understand the true individual variability. Again, A is for the reduction in mean body temperature, B is for the reduction in heart rate, uh, C on the bottom left is plasma volume, and D is for the increase in whole body sweat rate. And we separated the results from the different laboratories. For context, the top three bars um, are the original standard deviations for control, um, heat acclimation and heat acclimation with hypoxia um, from the previous um, error bars in the last slide. And the bottom hash bars are for the new calculated standard deviation response. So red is heat acclimation versus control and blue is heat acclimation uh, with hypoxia versus control. So you'll notice from the red heat acclimation bars that there was a similar variation between laboratories and the true individual heat acclimation response was reduced when the calculation was applied. It's important to remember that while for some markers of heat acclimation, the variability may appear smaller than others, the physiological context should be um, considered. For example, here an approximate 0.3 degrees standard deviation response for mean body temperature or a 7% standard deviation response in the change in plasma volume may be more meaningful than a five to 10 beat per minute standard deviation response for heart rate, particularly when compared to the mean inter intervention response. So by that, I mean, um, as an example, the mean change in, beam, in mean body temperature uh, following heat acclimation in, in some of our papers was uh, a reduction of 0.47 degrees C while the newly calculated standard deviation response was much smaller at 0 0.19 degrees C. So we can be quite confident in this intervention. So when heat acclimation was combined with hypoxia, it was generally unclear whether the true individual variability was altered, particularly for the mean body temperature and heart rate. Uh, so we're looking at the blue hashed bars at the bottom. Um, there, are, there is some indication um, that the true individual variability of the change in plasma volume response was lower with the addition of hypoxia um, than the variability with heat acclimation alone, um, while the true variability of the sweating response may be increased with the addition of hypoxia, um, and it's unclear why. Next slide, please. 
So to summarize, since the calculated true um, individual variability in the response to stresses accounts for normal biological variation through the use of a core cool comparator, um, standard deviation response is lower than the standard deviation commonly used or expressed in the literature. It's unclear whether the addition of hypoxia to heat acclimation affects the variability in the adaptive response, and this could depend on the measure in question. Um, but we do recommend that future environmental physiology studies present or discuss the true individual variability in the response measured in order um, to interpret the results, particularly in a culture of personalized um, medicine research um, or training um, that we're exploring in this symposium. Next slide, please. So I'd just like to finish by thanking uh, my colleagues, Alexandros, Joe, Mike, and Igor for the original data collection um, and for reanalyzing these data, as well as enabling me to present today. Um, I believe we'll be taking questions in the Q&A um, after this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the session on exercise training. Uh, as I mentioned, if you have any questions, please use the question and answer icon at the bottom of your screen to um, provide us with questions. Uh, we have 10 minutes for questions or a comfort break. Uh, we've received quite a few questions. So in case we don't manage to uh, address all of them, we will uh, ask the presenters or, or to address these questions and they'll be uh, provided, of course, um, uh, later, but uh, at the moment, I'll just address uh, or I'll look at some of the questions. Uh, one question, which was for Professor Kuskulu, was Would you agree that it is impossible to assess an individual's potential for performance or analyze their performance without a psychological assessment? Uh, could Maria please uh, address this? Yes, thank you, Igo. Um, it seems that the psychological part is uh, very uh, substantial, uh, depending on the personality, of course, uh, but a, a holistic approach to uh, assessing performance, uh, to our opinion, uh, should include some psychological assessment as well. So some, for some subject, these subjects, uh, this extra assessment might uh, prove uh, very useful, whereas to some others, it may just uh, be indifferent, I would say. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question now for Anne, if I may, uh, from Jonathan Scott. Um, a major issue we have in spaceflight is that the countermeasure exercise program attempts to target multiple physiological systems, outcomes such as bone mineral density, VO2 max, muscle force production, etc. Most studies, understandably, seem to focus on a single system or outcome measure. Are there any studies that have looked at individual responses across multiple systems or outcomes measures? Is the individual response the same across multiple systems, i.e. a person who has little or no response in VO2 max, also has little or no response in muscle strength, or in a different cardiorespiratory outcome? Uh, I hope that was clear. Can, can I ask Anne to address that question, please? So I don't know for space flight, <laughs> but uh, with respect to exercise training that has been analyzed by some studies and um, for measures of uh, cardiovascular performance and endurance, there were, of course, correlations, but um, I think it's important to state that if you classify subjects by different outcomes, then just by chance, even if they don't respond at all, hypothetically, there will be a response for one in 20, for example, with a 5% uh, level. So classification of response by multiple outcomes may result in underestimating the rate of complete non-response, if that exists for the exercise protocol under investigation, and may underestimate the proportion of complete response. Um, so yes, it has, this has been done, um, but it has to be like interpreted with even more caution than if only one 
criterion outcome is analyzed for the reason of alpha error formulation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I have a question from Maria Liora. I think uh, it, it probably can be addressed by all the uh, presenters, but I'd like uh, Rebecca perhaps to address this one. Uh, it was a question I had as well. Do you think that repeated interven intervention on an individual can introduce adaptation on the tested protocol? Uh, Rebecca, could you answer that please? So repeating the intervention will infect the, the future test and interfere with the results. Is that the question? It, the question is, you, re, you introduce repeated interventions or testing, I guess, on an individual. This will lead to adaptation in itself. So yeah. that the repeated intervention on an individual can introduce this adaptation. Uh, yeah, that's certainly something that we um, are concerned about, especially in, in um, investigating heat acclimation. You can't uh, measure the changes in the responses without in, um, giving some kind of stress and that might might add it to the um, to the changes. Um, so I think that is difficult to to reduce. Um, and so you have to think about that in the design of the methodology. Um, but if you can kind of uh, account for that by designing the study or by having a suitable washout period um, and reducing the number of kind of points in time where you can where you measure that, then then you can go some way to account for it, but also looking at the change in the responses and, and the variability within the baseline and the changes to those responses, then that can account for some of that, but it is difficult to not incite any adaptation at all. Um, perhaps using a population who you're um, more sure that they won't change or the, the changes that you see will be because of what you've done rather than um, the repeated testing. Thank you. Um, then we have a question from Maxui Jacques, uh, which states, it has been shown that consistent response is not found after a washout period, and same people respond differently after the same intervention uh, applied again, if the same intervention is applied again. How can this approach lead to better understanding of biological processes? What about the repeated testing approach? Uh, perhaps Anne can address this one. If you yeah. follow the question. So, I, I'm not sure about if this is now about repeated testing, which I would use for like testing, repeated testing within one uninterrupted intervention period, or um, a real replicated crossover where pre post intervention periods are like interrupted by, by washout. Yes. And in fact, this replicated crossover is now seen not much, but there are, is work out there for short-term interventions. And we also have some of those under, under review currently. And I think that helps a great deal. But for those short-term interventions, so we use it with recovery interventions in high-level athletes, so things like the cold water immersion, I think it really offers new insights because you can then separate the within subject variation, the consistency in the response of the individuals from true, in, true differences between athletes in our case. This even helps with generating practical recommendations for the participating athletes, which we use as to incentivize participation with high level athletes. So we can then really like assess an individual's response with a certain um, degree of, of precision. So I think that's really worth the trouble with intervention where it is practically feasible and where it can be made plausible that there are no enduring effects that can't be reversed because in that case, it, it doesn't make sense on a biological level. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll just finish with a comment. I don't think it's a, it's a question. It's from David Calhoun, uh, who states, I'm glad to see that you've appreciated Stephen Sen's uh, comments on the responder, non-responder question. It's so often been done wrongly. That's yeah. a comment, I suppose. And in fact, if I'm uh, permitted to say that, the finishing quote in my presentation 
it's in fact a quote from Stephen Sen that I permitted myself to modify for my end. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all the time we have for this question and answer period. There are a few questions which we'll, we, we will defer to the uh, statistical session uh, tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers in this session. And I'd like to continue now with the session on space physiology, which uh, has been underpinned by an ESA project, ongoing ESA project. Um, so the first presentation uh, titled A Meta-Analysis from Planitza Bedra Studies to investigate individual variability in skeletal muscle outcomes is by Rodrigo Fernandez Gonzalo from the Karolinska Institute together with Eric Luhmann, Adam McDonald from the Joseph Stefan Institute, Liz Simpson and Ian McDonald from uh, the, the Nottingham University and yours truly from the Joseph Stefan Institute. So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Er, uh, Dr. Fern Rodrigo Fernandez Gonzalo to give this presentation, please. Thanks a lot for the introduction, Igor and also for the opportunity to present this work in this uh, symposium. Uh, next slide, please. So for those that are not familiarized with the bedrest model, it is probably the best human space flight analog mimicking the effects of microgravity on the human body. However, this type of studies require a major investment in terms of facilities, time and personnel which is one of the reasons explaining the low number of subjects in each intervention group during bed rest studies. Normally, there are between five and 12 subjects in each group. Bed rest studies are normally performed uh, with a parallel group design where the control group undergoes only bed rest and the intervention group or groups are subjected to bed rest with one or more countermeasures, such as exercise, drugs, or nutrition. And looking at the past literature uh, in bed rest studies, it's actually quite difficult to group the different studies because they use different tests and different protocols to measure similar outcomes. And uh, on this line, one of the most common readout is the loss of skeletal muscle mass and function. And actually there is anecdotal evidence indicating some sort of variability in muscle losses during bed rest but there is no scientific evidence so far. Uh, maybe it's due to some of the limitations that I have just mentioned. Next slide, please. Uh, a special case in terms of bed rest study designs are the studies performed at Planica bed rest facility in Slovenia. So far, there have been three bed rest studies conducted there, Langhap, FEMHAP, and PLANHAP. On each of these studies, the participants were subjected to three interventions in a randomized crossover design, meaning that each participant performed the three interventions. And those interventions were a hypoxic ambulation, hypoxic and normoxic bed rest. And importantly, in all interventions and studies at Planica bed rest facilities, the battery of tests performed was very similar and the protocols identical. And in addition to that, the diet was individually tailored and controlled at all times. Next slide, please. So we decided to gather all the data related to muscle mass and function and body composition and create the database with the three Planica bed rest studies. And we actually pulled all the participants into the three interventions performed independently of a study of our origin, which translated into around 30 observations per intervention. Next one, please. In terms of variables, we ended up with 19 valid, uh, valid variables, including several outcomes related to body composition, assessed by DEXA, skeletal muscle function as isometric torque measured in a biodex dyna dynamometer in six muscle groups, skeletal muscle mass and fat mass in the thigh and calf that was assessed by computer tomography, and the data on the real caloric intake in relation to the targeted diet. Next one, please. So now, from now on, I will explain what we did with this unique database that I have just described. And for your information in the gray box on the top right corner of the slide, uh, you can find a description of the workflow that we have performed. And it will, be, it will be visible during the rest of the presentation. And this is meant for you to or yeah, to give you, to facilitate the understanding of the different steps that we have completed. So the first analysis that we performed was aimed at uh, investigating the pre to post difference in each group 
in order to determine the effect size of the changes in each of the 19 variables with bad rest. Next slide, please. In the graphs shown now, you can see the mean pre to post difference in raw units for some of the variables. So uh, dorsiflexors, I was saying in the left panel, plantar flexors, knee flexion, knee extension, and elbow, elbow flexion and extension. And in the right panel, you can see the mean difference for calf and thigh muscle area. Orange color corresponds to the ambulatory group, and green are purple to normoxic and hypoxic bed rest, respectively. And as you can see in general, the three groups suffered the decrease in the variables investigated. That is a loss of muscle mass and function with bed rest or uh, norm, uh, hypoxic ambulation. However, it is very clear that the effects of ambulation are trivial compared to the ones induced by the two bed rest interventions. Next slide, please. So the next step was to identify the variables that were more consistently affected by the bed rest. And to do so, we compare the chain score, that is the post to pre difference within a group, between our bed rest intervention groups and our control group, that in our case was the ambulatory group. And although the ambulatory group may not be seen as a regular control group due, due to the hypoxic condition, it actually allows us to compare the data controlling not only for genetic factors, because I remind you the study had the crossover design, but also for intervention time and caloric intake. And those traits can be very important for the outcomes that uh, we are studying. And also it should be acknowledged that by employing the ambulatory group as our control group, we are using a rather conservative approach, since as we have seen in the previous slide, the majority of the detected changes after hypoxic ambulation went in the same direction as the changes during the bed rest campaigns. And therefore, may have masked some of the effects of bed rest. Next slide, please. So in these three plots, uh, you can see the chain score analysis comparing our control group with the two bed rest interventions for a set of variables. Not all the variables are shown. Though. On the left panel, you can see the muscle function variables. In the middle, those related to the calf muscle group, and on the right, to the thigh muscle group. And the symbols in black indicate the standardized difference in relative terms, including all the subjects, in red color plant hub subjects, in blue fan hub, and in yellow land hub subjects. And the bars indicate 90% confidence in terms. Looking at the graphs, you can see that there are several variables where the chain score was greater for uh, one or the two bed rest intervention, and they are highlighted uh, by an asterisk. But there were only three variables, those marked with the red square, where the chain score was significantly greater in both bed rest interventions compared to the hypoxic ambulation. Those variables were knee extension torque and muscle area of calf and thigh. And if you think about it, this is not surprising because those variables are shown before are the ones showing a greater pre to post effect size after bed rest. So with this in mind, uh, we can say that our this uh, sort of meta-analysis in Planitia bed rest studies demonstrated that muscle mass and force in muscle groups involved in locomotion are the variables more consistently affected by bed rest. Next slide, please. So after this, we decided to investigate the individual variability in response to bed rest in the three variables more robustly affected by bed rest that is knee extension torque and thigh and calf muscle area. And we studied the three individual response using the definition suggested by several experts in the field, such as Will Hopkins or Greg Atkinson and Alan Butterham. Uh, that is calculating the standard deviation of the individual response, SDIR, which is in color red in the slide. Uh, this approach takes into consideration the standard deviation of both the experimental group in our case, we had two experimental groups, normoxic and hypoxic bed rest, and the control group, which for us was the ambulatory group. And you can see the formula we employed on, in the slide. Once the standard deviation of the individual response was obtained, we calculated the typical overall effect of bed rest on an individual. And we did this as the mean intervention effect compared to control, plus minus the standard deviation of the individual response. This analysis provides the range of distribution of the individual response to a particular intervention, bed rest in our case. Next slide, please. 
So the results for the typical Robelor effect of the interventions are now on the screen. And the graphs shown from left to right, the expected change in knee extension torque and thigh and calf muscle area that the random individual would suffer if subjected to bed rest in our two intervention groups. On the x-axis, you can see the expected change in row units. And in the yellow number on each side of the bars, you can see how those values translate in relation to the baseline values. So what we found was that the range of response to bed rest would go from no loss at all to minus 17% for knee extension torque and between 2 and 12% losses for calf muscle area. You can also see that the, the numbers for the thigh where actually there seems to be a slightly less variability when the bed rest is performed in an ormoxic environment. All in all, we believe that these results show that there is, there is individual variability in the response to bed rest in these three variables, and that this individual variability, given the numbers shown in the graphs, is clinically relevant, maybe to a lower extent for the changes in thigh muscle area, in particular for the normoxic bed rest. Next slide, please. So our next step was to establish the level of repeatability in the response to our two bed rest interventions in the three selected variables. And you may ask yourself, why is repeatability important? Well, when investigating the magnitude of alterations that each participant suffered during both bed rest campaigns, you have two options, right? If the response between normoxic and hypoxic bed rest is different, and now I'm following the right arrow in the screen, then the variability we just described is explained by inter-campaign effects, and therefore it would be influenced by external factors. However, if the response across uh, bed rest campaigns is similar, and now looking at the left arrow, then the variability is explained by intra-subject factors, and therefore we can confirm that the individual variability is real. Next uh, slide, please. So in these three graphs, you can see the correlation of the change score for normoxic bed rest uh, in the x-axis and hypoxic bed rest in the y-axis. On the left, the results for knee extension torque are presented in the middle for calf muscle area and in the right for thigh muscle area. And as you can see, the response for knee extension torque is not repeatable, but when it comes to changes in muscle mass, muscle atrophy induced by bed rest, both thigh and calf show a comparable effect in both bed rest campaigns. And therefore our data indicate that there is a high degree of repeatability for muscle mass outcomes after bed rest. Next slide, please. So I would like to show this analysis using another type of graph called repli uh, replicated means. Here you can see the response of each individual in both bed rest interventions indicated by the two dots and the mean response to bed rest as the purple line in between the dots. On the left, again, you have knee extension torque in the middle calf muscle area and in the right thigh muscle area. And again, as you can see, the effects of our two bed rest interventions on muscle mass were very consistent with the two dots of each subject being very close to each other. Next slide, please. So now let's take a moment to recap a bit and uh, look at what we have done so far. So we have established the variables that are more consistently affected by bed rest, that are knee extension torque and calf and thigh muscle area. And using these variables, we have identified clinically relevant individual variability. And we have shown that this variability is repeatable across bed rest interventions, at least for muscle mass loss. Next slide, please. So now, well, what is the next step? Well we thought it was uh, important to investigate if there is any moderator of the individual response. That is to check if any factor influenced the individual response. And considering the database that we had, we hypothesized that baseline values and the deviations in the caloric intake from the tailored diet would actually influence the individual response. Next slide, please. So in these three figures, you can see the correlations between the chain scores and the pre-values for knee extension torque on the left and calf and thigh muscle area in the middle and the right respectively. And uh, while it's quite clear that the correlations were highly significant, indicated that the stronger an individual is or the more muscle he or she has, the more forced and muscle mass that person will lose during bed rest. 
And therefore, it is clear that baseline values are a strong moderator of the individual response to bad rest. But uh, taking this from a physiological perspective, maybe these results indicate a strong regression to the mean phenomena. And maybe this is something worth discussing later today or tomorrow. Next slide, please. So as mentioned before, we also investigated the role of uh, the deviations in the individually tailored diet as a moderator of the individual response. And we did that by using the change score between the targeted and the real caloric intake on each day. Next slide, please. Our results showed that there was no relationship between diet and muscle outcomes. However, the deviations in the diet correlated with whole body mass and whole body fat mass. So the interpretation of this is that if subject ingested more or less calories than those established by the individualized diet, they would gain or lose weight and fat mass. However, such failure to comply with the caloric, with the tailored caloric intake would not have consequences for skeletal muscle loss of mass and function. And these results actually support previous reports indicating that diet has a quite limited impact in muscle mass atrophy during bed rest. Next slide, please. So finally, uh, we decided to be a bit more creative and we took a global exploratory approach to the changes in calf muscle area in the planitia bed rest studies. The fact that we chose the calf muscle area variable for this set of, of analysis was based on three things. Our observation indicating that calf muscle area is the most consistently altered outcome uh, across studies and bed rest campaigns. And that is also one of the outcomes with most significant inter-individual inter variability. And also it has a high degree of repeatability across bed rest interventions. Next slide, please. So to this end, we used the supervised machine learning method called orthogonal partial least square regression or PLS regression to explore if the global change scores in the other 18 variables in our database could actually be, could be used to model the change in calf muscle area after bed rest. Next slide, please. So after many validation steps, we were able to uh, generate a successful OPLS regression. And in the graph shown, you can see the correlation between the observed real change in calf muscle area in the Y axis and the predicted change in calf muscle area in the X axis, considering the variance in the other 18 variables. And as you can see, the correlation was quite good. And indeed, the model had the prediction accuracy of around 43%. And now you may ask, you may ask yourself, well, you took 18 variables into account, but what are the variables that influence more our model? And we also investigated that. Please, uh, next slide. So we perform a variable importance in projection analysis to determine the weight of each variable in our prediction model. And as you can see in the figure, the variables contributing most to the successful modeling were thigh muscle area, whole body mass, and knee extension torque. But it should be acknowledged, however, that while other variables may not contribute as much to the model, they still carry on important information into the system. Next slide, please. So now, uh, finally, to the conclusions. And I have decided to leave the workflow chart during the conclusion such that you can relate the analysis and the steps we have performed with the main conclusions that I will now mention. Next slide, please. So the first outcome of this project is that by using one of the biggest bed rest data sets to date, we were able to determine that the variables more robustly affected by bed rest are knee extension isometric torque and calf and thigh muscle area. Next one, please. Our individual variability analysis indicated that there, e there is clinically relevant individual variability in knee extension torque, calf muscle area, and to a lower extent, thigh muscle area. Next one, please. We also showed that the individual response to bed rest is repeatable across interventions, at least for muscle mass losses in the thigh and the calf. Next one, please. And finally, we identified baseline values as a strong moderator of the individual response to bed rest. 
as well as, well, to a lower extent, a global bed rest campaign response where muscle mass and function changes contributed most to the model. I remind you that uh, this model was tested for calf muscle area only. And I'd like to mention that it would be interesting now to see if by adding more variables to our prediction models, such as psychological or maximal oxygen uptake changes during bed rest, the prediction accuracy of the model would increase. And this is uh, clearly something that we would like to test in the future. Next one, please. So finally, I would like to thank my colleague from Karolinska Institute, Patrick Sumblat, uh, who has helped a lot uh, in this work, as well as the great effort from all co-authors, uh, in a special Eric Ruhrman. And uh, finally, the European Space Agency to, uh, for providing their uh, financial support. And with this, I end my presentation. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Rodrigo, for that nice presentation and overview. Uh, an introduction to this uh, session on, on space physiology. Uh, the next presentation, uh, of course, before we go to the next presentation, I'd just like to uh, remind everyone that you can type in your or enter your questions in the question and answer um, uh, section, the icon on the bottom of the screen, and we'll try to answer these at the end, at the, at the end of the session. So the next presentation is titled Individual Variability in the Effect of Hypoxic Confinement on Sleep Architecture by Olivier Mayres from Freya University in Belgium, uh, Helio Fernandez Talios from IMEC in Belgium, myself from the Joseph Stefan Institute, and Lea Dolins Groschen from the University Medical Center of Ljubljana, Slovenia. Uh, I would now like to ask Professor Mayres to uh, give the presentation. Please. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Igor. It's nice to see each other for the first time in real life now. <laughs> all this mail contact. So to, uh, indeed my talk today will be on uh, the effect of hypoxic confinement on sleep architecture parameters. Next slide please. Next slide please. So um, I will talk about two studies um, today and the challenges we faced with uh, the data analysis. Uh, the first study is uh, Neuropol, uh, which is a study on um, well, uh, funded by the ESA to uh, look at the effects of uh, hypoxic confinement in 13 participants, which were all males, during a 13-month stay uh, at Concordia in uh, Antarctica with an equivalent uh, altitude uh, about uh, 3,800 meters. And also uh, the FEMHAP study, which was um, uh, uh, well, talked about with my previous presenter in uh, the FEMHAP study, which took place in uh, Planitza. Um, so we faced similar challenges, and it's nice to see how uh, this data has been used by previous speakers also uh, with different uh, analysis techniques. And um, I will talk about the, the intuitive uh, statistical methods we use to uh, analyze these data. Uh, next slide, please. So for um, the data for Mars, for the Mars study, Neuropol, uh, our two main hypotheses were that altered photoperiodicity, so polar uh, seasonality, would impact sleep-related physiology and performance. But also, since Concordia is situated at altitude, that it would impact sleep parameters and uh, performance as well. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so we faced, uh, due to the um, operational and, and exceptional nature of uh, the, the, the design and, and the study, uh, we faced, of course, uh, well, uh, small samples uh, with only 13 participants that uh, uh, could participate. And we had repeated measures, uh, actually eight measurement cycles with the first measurement cycle. Uh, being uh, a baseline. So every six weeks, uh, each of the participants uh, were tested uh, uh, via polysomnographic recordings and also um, performance measurements, questionnaires, etc. So we had a large number of variables, uh, almost only 20, uh, 20 ver variables only for sleep uh, itself. And then, of course, another 10, 15 variables for performance measures. 
So um, we had also sparse and incomplete data uh, from all uh, the data we had, we could uh, use uh, 89 polysomnographic recordings, which is in that uh, setting still a lot. Um, and with 14 uh, PSGs uh, missing at random. So as you can see from the numbers here, uh, we had uh, high variability also in the data. And the problem was also data input, which was not done by, by ourselves but by the people over there. Uh, a lot of the data was just recorded on, on uh, pencil and paper as well. Next slide, please. So uh, because we want our papers to be read uh, by a lot of people, uh, we try to use statistical methods, uh, which more, most readers are familiar with. Uh, and so, of course, when you have repeated measures, the first thing, uh, first thing you think about is using repeated measures ANOVA to see if there is a, a, an effect of the state variable, an effect of the manipulation, the manipulation which is, of course, uh, altitude and uh, seasonality. Uh, but because of those missing data, uh, we tried several techniques to make it, them fit uh, to the model, actually. So first, it was pooling data per season, per trimester, but still uh, you lose a, a little bit of the, uh, well, the richness of uh, the variability of those data. So we tried other methods, um, like for example, by replacing missing values by means, medians, linear interpolation, linear trends, multiple imputation. Um, but to be honest, I'm not a great fan of those techniques myself because I, I really prefer using the data that was observed and not something that was uh, extensively modeled. Uh, but we had to do it because uh, repeated measures ANOVA uses uh, list-wise uh, deletion, deletion in case, uh, instead of case-wise deletion. So we had only two persons that complete the full uh, design. So that was problematic. We had something uh, uh, else in mind. Next slide, please. So uh, a generalization of the repeated measures ANOVA uh, can be found with uh, linear mixed models. And uh, they're much more flexible than, than repeated measures ANOVA. And they're actually uh, as easy to, to report in a, a scientific uh, paper. Um, but it's still a little bit more complex uh, and, and uh, a little more difficult to learn than, than just the repeated measures ANOVA. And some complex designs in terms of, uh, for example, com uh, covariance structure that you can use may not converge, and this can be problematic. So uh, the estimation is different, so, uh, different also in repeated measures ANOVA and linear mixed models, uh, LNM. Uh, generally use um, maximum likelihood or restricted uh, maximum likelihood estimations, which uh, allows for handling better um, missing data. Uh, so as I said, uh, LNM ju uh, just uh, use care, um, case-wise or pairwise deletion ex uh, in comparison to RepaNova with listwise deletion. So there's more flexibility also with the data. Uh, linear mixed models can work with continuous and discrete counts, categorical data, ordinal data, and so on. It makes the clustering also for handling multidimensional and multigroup data easier. And especially in our case, what, what was really interesting is that you can use a time variable as a continuous variable. So it allows to treating different time spacing, which uh, a normal ANOVA would, uh, repeated measures ANOVA would not uh, let us do. Um, next slide, please. Another, uh, next slide. I will come back to that slide later on. So, um, first of all, yes, um, uh, as we seen, uh, we have seen in, in uh, the previous presentation is that eyeballing your data is really important as a first step uh, to analyze it. And as you can see, for example, in the graph uh, below, uh, is that we have uh, a lot of inter-individual uh, variability, which can be accounted for by um, uh, plotting the different uh, uh, within subjects regression lines. Uh, but when we analyze those data, uh, of course, after all the effort we put in, uh, in in this experiment, we found almost uh, no significant effects of time on all the variables we tested. So that was a first shock. Uh, 
being in such an extreme condition and, and finding no effects uh, over time, except for um, obstructive apneas. Um, we were startled when we say, well, okay, what, what do we have to do now? Uh, what we found is, of course, when you look at the data, that the, that the intercepts were uh, highly significant. So that would mean that there is a high inter-individual uh, inter uh, variability, which sh should be higher than the intra-individual variability. Previous slide, please. Uh, can you move to the previous slide, please? Yeah. So um, uh, to account for that non-significant effect of time, we looked actually at uh, intra-class correlations, which by definition reflect the amount of between individual variability for a target variable relative to the total variability of the sample, including also between and within inter, uh, individual variability. So it's an imperfect measure uh, to quote uh, uh, Anna Hextaden, but still it's the best we have here. So um, we can actually uh, uh, see whether there is a trade variability or a state variability and which accounts uh, best for the data. So a large interclass correlation value which in, would indicate more trade variability or large differences in sleep parameters between persons, but small differences within persons. Small ICC would be, uh, the, um, uh, on the contrary, uh, more state variability and small differences in sleep parameters between persons, but large differences within persons. The two next slides, please. So next slide. Yeah. Um, first of all, again, uh, for the students that may be listening here, uh, it's really important to visualize data as well, because when you see, for example, in panel A, uh, there, is, there seems to be a variability in uh, apnea, hypopnea index. But when you, um, uh, when you plot the individual uh, data of each participant, it's much uh, easier to see how much the, the inter-individual variability is higher than the intra-individual variability and prompts you to use the correct analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, when uh, we, we did this analysis, we showed that uh, the degree of uh, inter-individual variability was quite high and especially for respiratory parameters and also for uh, deep sleep, which is in line with results we found also in uh, other um, experiments which were not as extreme uh, as ours. So uh, our uh, participants present with high altitude periodic breathing, which was expected, increased sleep onset latencies and reduced psychomotor speed. So except for obstructive apneas, all sleep, sleepiness and psychomotor performance variables remained stable over time. And that's an important feature as well. That means that uh, people did not acclimatize over time for those variables. Uh, and the individual differences in respiratory variables show the highest degree of stability and robustness, followed by fatigue, situ uh, situational sleepiness, sleep fragmentation, and psychomotor speed, which suggests in this context, moderate to substantial trait-like characteristics. Next slide, please. So when we analyzed the bedrest study from, from Planitza, it was uh, actually some, uh, a similar data set which, uh, which had a small sample size, repeated measures, large number of variables, sparse and incomplete data, only four cases completed everything uh, for uh, the uh, sleep-related variables. Uh, and high variability. The difference is here that the state condition is probably much more extreme than uh, people uh, in, uh, in Antarctica. It seems bizarre, but it's like that. So the, um, we expect uh, to, to begin with uh, to have probably a, a lower uh, inter-individual variability and higher state variability. Next slide, please. So first of all, again, for our students here, when you vi uh, visualize this variability, it's very important to keep in mind that you have to, to use the same uh, y-axis uh, um, to, 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 to check the variability here, uh, because you see, if you change a little bit the y-axis, it seems to be uh, 
comparable, but in the next slide, you can really see uh, how much of the variability uh, differs from one condition to the other. For example, for the AHI, the apnea hypopnea index, in normoxic condition, it stays relatively stable between ambulatory and bed rest uh, conditions, while it, it's, uh, it's very different um, in the hypoxic condition. And this is uh, well misleading and the left side of the panel when you uh, plot your data like that. But in the next slide, you will see that we perform this, uh, the same uh, analysis with uh, interclass correlations. Uh, in comparison to our uh, new report data, the, the uh, time variables were significant, um, but we observe some kinds of uh, uh, inter-individual inter stability, so a certain kind of trait robustness also in the data. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, for the results of those study, uh, we see that uh, a hypoxic environment affects light sleep, sleep maintenance, fragmentation, and so on. Bed rest mainly affects sleep fragmentation, and deep sleep proportions are affected by conditions, especially in ambulatory settings. And so deep sleep and respiratory uh, par parameters have also uh, moderate rate-like characteristics. And for my last slide now, um, it's uh, important to see that extreme state conditions may artificially reduce uh, the interclass correlation and underestimate rate like characteristics of physiological sleep related variables. So, if you really want to test this, it's better to have uh, st uh, a minimized state dependent um, uh, variance to be able uh, to uncover uh, those trade uh, trait effects. But on the contrary, when we come, uh, when we see now those two uh, data sets, we can see that if trait-like characteristics are found in extreme conditions, such as hypoxic confinement, for example, the evidence is even stronger for stable physiological traits in normal conditions uh, in sleep. And the, the, so the method that we use is quite easy to understand and may be valuable for uh, future studies as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier, um, for that uh, nice presentation on the a, a different area that is of sleep. Uh, I'd like to continue uh, with the present next presentation on heterogeneity and the responses of oxidative function in vivo and ex vivo to normoxic and hypoxic bed rest by Daisy Salvadego from the Joseph Stefan Institute, Bruno Grassi from University of Udine. Michael uh, Mikhail Karamidas and Ola Eichen from the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, and myself also from the Joseph Stefan Institute. Welcome, uh, Dr. Salvadego, and uh, please, uh, the, uh, the floor is yours, or well, the screen is yours. Thank you, Igor. Thank you for this opportunity to present uh, this data. I will show you some of the data of previous bed rest campaigns. Please, next. Next. Thank you. And uh, yes, we, we analyzed the effects of normoxin and hypoxic bed rest in uh, two different groups. We included uh, two uh, projects, one 10-day project and one 21-day project in uh, two groups of subject, male subject with comparable age and uh, anthropometric characteristics. Please, next. What we were interested in on was to, uh, to evaluate the effects of bed rest and hypoxic bed rest on uh, the oxidative function, particularly at the muscle level. And we combine different variables, peak pulmonary oxygen uptake, vastus lateralis fractional oxygen extraction, uh, obtained during the extension ex exercise, incremental exercise with one leg, which is mainly devoted to uh, analyze the muscle metabolic limitations and also mitochondrial respiration in permeabilized uh, fibers. Next slide, please. Briefly, what we, uh, what we found by 
looking at the mean results was that uh, bed rest reduces the peak uh, VO2, peak, perm peak uh, fractional oxygen extraction, but not mitochondrial respiration after 10 days, while hypoxic bed rest, the gray bar, did not affect this uh, variable significantly. Next slide. After 21 days, uh, we, we saw a, a significant reduction in all these variables, both after normoxic bed rest and hypoxic bed rest. And this reduction was similar between uh, these two conditions. Please, next. So uh, now uh, we reanalyze those data and uh, we try to, to see at the individual responses. And particularly, we were interested on looking at the variation and whether we found uh, differences in uh, individual variation between normoxic bed rest and hypoxic bed rest uh, between 10 days and 21 days and uh, uh, between uh, the more systemic variable view to peak versus more local uh, deep responses. Next, please. So uh, if we look at peak uh, VO2 measured during the extension, uh, and we, if we uh, look at the graph on the, uh, on the left, if we draw a line, we can uh, uh, almost connect all the bars. Uh, indeed, what we uh, concluded uh, on uh, considering the mean results was hypoxia uh, does not uh, has a neutral effect, so that does not add any uh, impairment to the bed rest effect, or even can uh, uh, somehow uh, preserve the reduction in a short duration. But, but if we look at the graph on the right, we can see that uh, irrespective of the duration, 10 or 21 days, and irrespective of the condition, bed rest or hypoxic bed rest, we can see different shades of colors, and which means uh, we, we can see subjects who uh, did not respond at all or responded just slightly to the intervention, and subjects who uh, were affected uh, markedly almost twice the mean response. Moreover, we can see that uh, there were subjects who responded completely different after hypoxic bed rest compared to normoxic bed rest. Next, please. Similar pattern of the responses can be uh, seen uh, for peak fractional oxygen extraction. If we look at the graph on the, on the right, again, we can see subject to who respond, uh, who were slightly affected and subjects who were markedly affected. And again, subjects who respond completely different after hypoxic bed rest compared to normoxic bed rest. Next, please. Uh, for mitochondrial respiration, uh, uh, the, the responses are somehow different. Uh, if we look at the graph on the right, uh, after 10 days, we, we had some subject, half of the subject, who uh, did not respond negatively, and subject who were uh, affected a lot. While after 21 days, again, we can see different shades of color. So we, we had subject who were not affected or slightly affected, and subject who were strongly markedly affected by the intervention, uh, up to 50-60% of decrease. Next, please. We try to correlate the results obtained uh, after normoxic bed rest with those obtained after hypoxic bed rest for all these variables. And uh, uh, we, we found just a mild correlation for VO2 peak after 10 days and no correlation at all for the other uh, 
variables, but what we can see if we look at the slide uh, as a first impact is that as we move from uh, the left to the right, from the VO2 peak to mitochondrial respiration, there is a large increase in, in variability. Next, please. So we try to put these changes for a, a single person in, a same, uh, in the same graph. Uh, let's focus on uh, the first uh, of, uh, on the top, uh, for instance, the 10 days normoxibo rest. Uh, we can have different combination of changes for each subject, but uh, uh, there are a couple of examples uh, in blue, we, we can see that uh, there are subjects who are not affected negatively in a mitochondrial respiration, the symbols on the, uh, on the left, but the same subject where um, experience a, a great, uh, a marked reduction in a peak fractional oxygen extraction and also in VO2 peak. On the other hand, we can see subjects who are markedly affected in mitochondrial respiration, less in peak fractional oxygen extra extraction, and uh, less or at all affected for VO2 peak. This was true for normoxibid rest and for hypoxibid rest. This was true for the 10 days and the 21 days. So two points uh, uh, looking at these graphs. One is uh, that variability is large in, uh, in the muscle, local muscle responses, and it is reducing progressively uh, and much lower on the more integrative variable, which is VO2 peak. And the other point is, uh, can be a question, uh, so which can be the, the key, the, the, the key determinants of this variation in, uh, in the VO2 peak response. Next one, please. So to conclude, uh, to sum up uh, what we found on this, uh, uh, what we, we saw on this graph, is that bed rest affects the oxidative function, yes, but uh, there is variability, and this is uh, evident after short periods and also after medium term uh, exposure. Hypoxic bed rest, we said uh, it has a neutral effect, hypoxia when added to bed rest, yes, but uh, for what we can see, it seems that uh, uh, hypoxia when added to bed rest adds variability. And this seems more after 21 days and more in the local deep uh, responses. And then variability is large in the determinants of VO2 peak, so in the local responses, but it is much lower on the more integrative outcome of VO2 peak. Next, please. So next step could be to uh, include also some upstream variable, let's say uh, VO2 peak, whole body VO2 peak, which is the more integra integrative variable uh, related also with the health status of the subject. And we can, we could calculate the probability, probability to have a, a greater variation in hypoxia bed rest compared to normoxia bed rest, or in the 21 days compared to the 10 days. Next, please. And thank you to all the contributors of uh, these uh, projects, these projects and uh, this uh, uh, individual variability project. And thank you. Thank you very much, Daisy, for a nice presentation. Great. and. Uh, your last slide uh, on Bayesian uh, statistics almost introduces the next presentation. <laughs> Thank you. So the next presentation is psychological status during hypoxic and normoxic inactivity or bed rest, applying Bayesian statistics to the analysis of individual variability.
Uh, this will be a joint presentation by Kunihito Tobita of the Osaka Prefecture University in Japan and Adam McDonald from the Joseph Stefan Institute in Slovenia. Co-authors on this study are Nectaria Stavru from the National and Capodistrian University of Athens and myself from the Joseph Stefan Institute and also associated with the Sam Fraser University in British Columbia, Canada. So I would like to ask, first of all, Adam to start the presentation and uh, he will then be followed by Kunihito. Adam? Thanks, Igor. He Hello, good morning. Uh, lovely to be here. Well, half here anyway. Uh, Rosie, if we could go straight to the first slide, please, that'd be great. Um, <clears throat> if we let these two speech bubble brains here represent different people, like you and I, with different feelings and different emotions, words, different responses, and ultimately let them represent inherent variation. We can then start to easily understand that typically as humans, it seems that variation within our system or any system, in fact, is well tolerated. And perhaps if we really think about it, it's actually desirable. We need that bit of variation and that fluctuation to drive change and adaptation to particular environmental uh, environments or environmental stressors. Um, from an emotional perspective, is having a response or a set point of neutral, acceptable, or even appropriate? And how could we go about our day without having some emotional response? What kind of dreary concept would that be or existence? Do we really expect everyone to follow, <clears throat> willingly follow the same response to certain sort of situations? And of course, no, and nor should we. But why do we allow our day-to-day -day lives fluctuate and vary? but we don't consider or expect the same thing to happen in our experimental lives. And to me, that seems odd. So what do we do? Uh, next slide, please. Well, historically, what we've done is we've ignored it. And I myself self am guilty, and I've added a limitation to a paper to have another researcher consider this in the future. So if you take this population on the left, here you can see there's reds and greens and blues and blacks and all sorts of colors and people and mixes. And what we do is we break them up into groups or interventions like ABC, or in this case, normoxic bed rest or hypoxic bed rest. And then following our experiment, we find something significant, which is great. Now we see this on the graph on the right, but in each of those groups, you see that there are varying shades of each color and they represent uh, variation. Now we can hide this, or we can ignore it in the standard deviation as you see here, or for being really sneaky, we might, we might put in standard error mean. So the aim of today's talk is to take this data that I've once published and apply a new analytic approach to see if we've glazed over something important or potentially very interesting. Next slide, please. So in the last 10 years, what we've done is conducted a, a program of research to examine the individual and combined effects of hypoxia with bed rest um, on multiple physiological and psychological outcomes. And these are the studies listed below here. Now, one thing to note before I hand you over to my colleague, Professor Tobita, is that while we label these studies 10 days and 21 days, the actual subject commitment is 18 days and 33 days respectively for those, for those interventions. But even more so is when it comes to the crossover design, the difference in the time commitment is five months for the 10-day study and more than a year for the 21-day study. And this will become important later. So now over to you, Professor Tobita, and the next slide, please. Thanks, Adam. One measure of the individual differences is the standard deviation. However, the number of participants in the bed rest study is relatively small and may not reflect individual differences in the population. Therefore, we adapted a combined Bayesian statistic and the Markov chain method to obtain a standard deviation and mean. Please, next slide. We can generate sample data using the Bayesian method, and then we run it thousands of times to generate the each group from the normoxic bed rest and hypoxic bed rest. We generate a large number of probability sample data, and then from that generation of the, of the data, we can see that the distribution of to 5,000 changes, but after 5,000 to 10,000, there are no more changes in the distribution of the generated data. 
So we know the prediction is pretty accurate at that point. And then once we know it's accurate, we start to analyze the generated data set. We can find the means and the standard deviations from each sample set, iteration 5000, 5001, 5002, and so on, all the way up to 10,000. We also compare the difference between normoxic bed rest and hypoxic bed rest groups, and we see all those differences. Then, as shown in right upper graph, we create 95% high density interval, which range from 101 to 102, is where our, our predictions for the mean. Please, next slide. In Bayesian estimation, the p-value is not used for to indicate significance. Instead, we look at the 95% high density intervals generated by the difference between the groups. Upper figure shows that the difference of the mean is more than 0.16 at minimum and up to 1.89 at most. We consider that the difference between the groups in the mean leads us to significance in there. And we can say those two groups are different. Please, next slide. Let's take a look at the result of the analysis. I will only show you the results of the duration effect, the means and the standard deviations for conditions 10 days and 21 days are shown in left and the right. Since we are interested in individual differences, let's see the standard deviation on the right. In hypoxic bed rest, uh, there are significant differences between conditions 10 days and 21 days at intervention pre and post. So 21 days showed the larger individual differences than 10 days condition. Please, next slide. The total mood disturbance for each participant were estimated by Bayesian regression model. The 10 days condition shown by the blue line has a small difference in the pre and a larger difference in the in intervention mid and late periods. Increasing pre to mid, it could indicate the hypoxic effect. On the other hand, the 21 days condition does not change the emotional statement during intervention. However, the individual differences remain wide ranging from pre to post. Although there is a difference in the emotional statement between participants, it can be interpreted as an overall stability. Uh, please, next slide. I show you again this prediction data, which is one, which is a one on the right. I want to compare it to the actual data that we recorded so that I can highlight the difference between the two methods. You can see there's a lot of noise in actual data. It becomes very difficult to run statistics and find significance within that data set. What we do is we remove the noise and show predictions with a high degree of accuracy. We can highlight both individual differences and change of the groups. Then we can find results and characterize our data are more appropriately. This is where I pass the bat button to Adam. Sorry, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, so there you have it. Surprisingly, it seems that there's differences that do exist between participants in their responses to bed rest and hypoxia. Uh, what I failed to mention earlier is that there are several sources of that error or variability within the experiment uh, itself. And this could be the precision or the accuracy of the measurement tool. Uh, 
in this case, the POMS instrument. It could be inherent random effects of the participant or their psychological approach to the study. So in this case, their perceived time commitment and how, how the difference between the 10 day and the 21 day studies highlight that the five month period versus one year of commitment affects the uh, baseline uh, psychological status. And then finally, we have the observer effect. That would be us, the researchers, the team, the Planitza environment and how all of the staff and the participants themselves interact. Uh, we, we would also need to consider that the process of adaptation to the environmental stressor also causes uh, variation among the participants. It should be clearly stated that there is a significant difference in the duration of 10 days and 21 days and the process of adaptation to these timelines is different. And we need to consider how the variance <clears throat> of these physiological adaptations or maladaptations might combine to affect the psychological response. Uh, now, there are two key uh, advantages to this new method or the Bayesian approach to analyzing our data. And that is the first one that Konehito mentioned is noise reduction. It simply cleans up our data and provides us with a nice visual interpretation. And the second is dealing with our small sample size. So even if we were to add extra participants to this model, it wouldn't <clears throat> increase the prediction accuracy or provide us with more pro uh, accurate results. So ultimately, how do we new use this new information now? As moving forward with our next bed rest studies, we are now better prepared to deal with these data statistically. And crucially, does this new information teach us anything about how we should conduct the study or how we should interact with our participants? Maybe we should ask them, how well they coped or how they're coping rather than how badly they coped. And then finally, what is our relevance to space? Uh, <clears throat> we must also note that the psychological responses here within this experimental situation are not quite the same as those we see in the real world um, or to our participants. And they're not really the same as we see with astronauts. And the second thing is that the level of hypoxia may be different here in our experiment compared to uh, future uh, spacecraft ha habitats. But we can say that hypoxia causes mood disturbances and that there are large variations in those responses. However, as time in confinement increases, it appears that the responses become more stable, which is apparently good news for space. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Adam and Kunihito, for that nice uh, overview of the psychological aspects of the bed rest studies. And that concludes our session on space physiology. We have uh, a few minutes uh, to answer, to address some questions. Uh, most of the questions are statistical in nature. And as I mentioned, will be transferred to the panel tomorrow uh, at the end of the, tomorrow's meeting. But the few questions uh, that we have um, uh, that, that are more physiological, I would uh, ask one question from Ella Walker. This is probably to Rodrigo. Is there any difference between men and women with regards to the importance of uh, uh, KE, isotorque, and calf muscle area in the bed rest studies? Um, Rodrigo, could you answer that, please? Yeah, um, so far, I'm not only uh, thinking about the Planitia bed rest studies, but also about 60 day bed rest studies performing Europe and US, 90 day bed rest studies also in Europe. I would say that the response in terms of muscle mass and muscle function when uh, addressed by isokinetic or isometric uh, means, it's very comparable between men and women. There are some other aspects that can be a bit influenced, but uh, the response in muscle outcomes is extremely, it, it's very similar between men and women. That's why I think now ESA is thinking about having mixed uh, sex groups, so men and women in the same group. Thank you, Rodrigo. Um, we have one question to uh, uh, Dr. Salvadego from Bruno Grassi, the, one of the co-authors, uh, who states congratulations for the interesting approach. The smaller variability in systemic variables, i.e. VO2 peak, versus more distal variables, e.g. HRR, could be due to the fact that VO2 peak is a more, in quote, established variable, easier to do, to determine, and more reproducible. Uh, and I was, uh, I would just add to that, it does seem very interesting when you go from the sort of the um, 
local level, as in your paper, there's a large variation, but when you go to the systems level, the variation decreases. So, uh, Daisy, could you address that? Yes, uh, uh, for sure, there is one part which we don't know. Uh, for instance, uh, if we consider the mitochondrial variables, the mitochondrial function, for sure, variability can be in part greater because of uh, it has its own intrinsic variability it depends from uh, particularly to the part of the tissue collected so uh, all these things uh, for sure adds more variability while uh, vo 2 peak uh, is uh, uh, in part uh, much more um, general as uh, as variable so uh, for sure um, the protocol are much more uh, standardized and also uh, what we measure the, the gas exchange of the mouth uh, are less sensitive to really small changes uh, but also we can see that uh, um, I think that the, the point uh, is that uh, uh, it seems that there are some compensatory mechanisms that uh, in somehow guarantee uh, the, the, the more integrative uh, outcome. Uh, I mean, VO2Peak is uh, much more, seems at least, that uh, VO2Peak is much more preserved for uh, any changes compared to more local or deep variables. Thank you very much, Daisy. Uh, and one last question, perhaps for uh, Olivier, uh, related to the repeatability issues that has sort of been uh, uh, sort of the a factor commented by many of the previous speakers. In other words, when you do a PSG in these type of situations, you you don't really get an, a, a clear understanding of the repeatability of the measures, uh, or do you? Can you address that, uh, if you're still here, Olivier? Yeah, well, in, in for PSG measures, uh, if, if you are, are talking about the adaptability of, of the, the organism to the kind of measurements they are, do they adapt to, to, to the fact that uh, they're monitored in the sleep and, and so on? Well, it's, it's fairly... Uh, easy actually it doesn't seem like that but it's fairly easy to 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 sleep with that equipment and after one or two nights you're um well adapted to sleep with the equipment so the the first night effects that we uh, observe for example with the measurement session the first measurement session well they're uh, almost well negligible over the long time uh but about the, 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 the variables as uh, the, the physiological variables, well, they seem to stay uh, relatively stable in time when you uh, use the same uh, uh, state, for example, if you are going to measure uh, repeatedly um, uh, poly, polysomnographic variables over time, they, they tend to stay stable. So there is some 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 kind of uh, well, let's say uh, a, a footprint uh, of sleep which uh, remains uh, over time. Yeah, is that an answer to your question? Yes, I think that is okay. correct. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Olivier. So this brings us to the end of the um, of the space physiology section, uh, and uh, we are now um, going to continue with the session on temperature regulation. So I would like to introduce the first presentation on individual variation in the vascular response of individuals to thermal challenges. This will be, uh, this presentation is by Jennifer Wright from the University of Portsmouth, as well as Professor Michael Tipton, Heather Massey, and Claire Eglin, all from the University of Portsmouth. So uh, Dr. Wright, can I ask you to present this, please? Thank you. Hi there, uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you to, for inviting me to present today. Um, today I'm going to be presenting on the individual variation in the vascular response to thermal challenges and the data that I'm going to be presenting forms part of a wider study in which we're uh, investigating the pathophysiology of non-freezing cold injury. So um, next slide please. 
So for those of you who are unaware, non-freezing cold injury is an injury that occurs at the extremities and is caused by prolonged cold and often wet exposure, where the tissue remains above freezing point. So colloquially, you may know this as trench foot or the immersion foot syndrome, as it remains above freezing point between zero to 15 degrees centigrade. And it's often very common in the outdoor occupations as well as the MOD. This study aimed to investigate the pathophysiology and we investigated this within three groups. So the first group was our NFCI cohort, and these are people that have been diagnosed with NFCI. Our second group was a control cohort who had experienced a similar level of cold exposure, but did not have a cold injury. And our third group was a control cohort who had not experienced notable levels of cold exposure and did not have a cold injury. Um, so next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. So to investigate the pathophysiology, we conducted a whole host of tests, which range, from which range from vascular in nature through to neural, combined with blood biomarker analysis, as well as questionnaires. Um, for the purposes of presentation, I'm going to be focusing on two of the vascular tests. So next, please. Uh, which is the cutaneous local heating protocol and cold sensitivity test, which provided a thermal challenge. For all of these tests, which are presented here today, uh, we had to control for a lot of um, extraneous variables, which could have had an influence on the results. So next slide, please. And these are all the factors that we had to control for. So the first was our skin temperature, which as some of you may be aware, with the more instruments, you can have an integrated um, thermode, where we were able to clamp the skin temperature where we wanted it to be. We also controlled for the ambient temperature. So the cutaneous local heating protocol was conducted in 24 degrees, whereas the cold sensitivity test was conducted in 30 degrees. We also asked all of our participants to conduct some standardized exercise before taking part in the tests uh, to remove any vasoconstrictive tone, which has been found to influence the results. Uh, we also control for nutritional factors, which we know can affect vasculature, such as the caffeine, uh, foods rich in nitrate, alcohol, and also smoking before we conducted the tests. Um, we also controlled what the participants were wearing, so they came in wearing standardised PT kits. And between our three groups, we also matched our participants for the basic anthropometric factors, so age, height, mass, as well as their ethnicity, which we know can have an effect on vasculature. And this was really to try and minimise that individual variation and um, influence on, that could affect the results of each test. So next slide, please. So what is the cutaneous local heating protocol? Well, it's a protocol which is depicted by three distinct phases. The first phase being a 10 minute baseline period in which we measured the skin surface blood flow using the Moore's laser Doppler, Moore laser Doppler instruments, um, where we clamped the skin temperature at 33 degrees centigrade. We then increased this temperature of the thermos to 42 degrees for a further 20 minutes, and then increased it further again to 44 degrees for a further 15 minutes. Of these three phases, we were interested in four distinct time points. So a region of interest at baseline, the initial peak in skin surface blood flow following the increase in temperature, a stable region of interest at 42 degrees, followed by a stable region of interest at 44 degrees. From this flux data, we then took it forward, converted it into cutaneous vascular conductance measures, uh, which we then used for our analyses. So next slide, please. So we can see these four uh, regions of interest that we're interested in um, depicted on these four graphs here, uh, where we have plotted the mean and standard deviation of cutaneous vascular conductance or CVC for the three groups. Now, from looking at these graphs, you'd be forgiven for thinking that our NFCI and our cold control group were very similar in nature, whereas our, thir our third group, our control group, was very much reduced across all time points. Um, from this, you might expect there to be some statistical significance within the groups. However, when we overlay the individual data, so next please. So here we can see the individual data for each participant, where you can see that there's a lot of overlay and a lot of individual variability, both within the groups and between the groups. And from this, as a result, we did not actually see any statistical significance across any time points during the cutaneous local heating protocol. So next slide, please. So moving on to our next test, we had the cold sensitivity test. And some people in the audience may be very much familiar with this, as it has been in, used in the past as a tool for assessing non-freezing cold injury. Again, it's depicted by three uh, classic points. So a stable baseline period, uh, 
which consisted of resting in 30 degrees centigrade, followed by a two minutes immersion of the affected extremity, so in our participants it was their left foot, in 15 degrees centigrade water. We were then primarily interested in, uh, for these purposes presentation, the skin temperature as well as the skin surface blood flow in the 10 minute rewarming period following this immersion. So next slide please. And that is what we can see depicted on these two graphs here. So on the graph on the left, we have our skin temperature of the great toe, whereas our graph on the right depicts is the uh, CVC values once again. Um, and these red lines on the graph show three time points. So pre-immersion, five minutes post-immersion and 10 minutes post-immersion, what was happening in the great toe. Um, so the red line is our NFCI cohort. And as you can see, quite surprisingly, there is a lot of individual variation um, between the group. So we'd expect to see these um, quite closely bunched together if the phenotype of non-freezing cold injury was typical between each participant. However, as you can see, they're quite spaced out. And this becomes even more complex when we then overlay the cold control group. So next, please. Which we can see here on our blue lines. So typically we'd expect to see a lower skin temperature and CVC within our NFCI group um, versus our cold control group, because in theory, our cold control group are not injured. However, as you can see, they're very much intertwined, um, which becomes further complicated again when we then overlay our control group. So next, please which we can see in the green lines here. And these are supposed to be people that have had not very notable levels of cold exposure that are explain, um, displaying very similar results compared to our NFCI cohort. Um, so next, please. Surprisingly enough, we did actually see some significant difference between our control group versus our NFCI group, 10 minutes following immersion. Um, so although this was statistically significant at that time point within skin temperature, we've got to be very wary here of depicting the difference between clinical significance versus statistical significance. Although statistical significance was present, uh, we then need to consider moving forward once we've depicted the pathophysiology of NFCI, how we then take that forward into building a classification or diagnosis system. Um, so based on these graphs here, um, I would not be very comfortable in taking forward skin temperature at 10 minutes post-immersion forward as a clinical diagnostics tool, singularly on its own, to diagnose non-freezing cold injury. It very much has to be used in combination with some of the other tests that we've conducted, such as the cutaneous local heating protocol or others that are listed um, within the first few slides, the tests that we've investigated. So moving on to the next slide, please. So what does this mean moving forward? Well, we've been looking into different forms of analyses. So although for this study, we've already conducted the basic levels of different ANOVAs, we've enlisted the help of various statisticians to try and undertake some form of clustering analysis. So from our three groups, we can see that they're clearly not distinct in nature within the results that we've obtained. But from clustering analysis, we hope to take the key attributes from the various tests that we've taken forward um, to then hopefully form more discrete group classifications. Following on from my PhD, we then hope to form um, another study in which we test a more homogeneous patient group. So from our injured participants, they've been injured uh, for various time frames. So there's those that were diagnosed fairly recently within the past two years or so, as well as those that were diagnosed sometimes up to seven years previously. So we're hoping to test in patients that have been diagnosed within the past year or so to try and form a more homogeneous phenotype of the non-freezing cold injury that is depicted. Then also try and reduce that individual variation that is then presented with the injury. But from what we can conclude from this is that NFCI is a multifaceted continuum. No singular test should be taken forward to differentiate between NFCI patients versus the control patients due to the high level of individual variability that is presented within each injury. So what is displayed in one person can be totally different to the next. And we really need to consider that with the type of tests that are taking forward to build up our diagnoses. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, please. I'd just like to thank everyone for their time and for listening. Um, I'd very much like to thank the participants for taking part in the study, as well as Dr. Sarah Hollis for allowing access to her patients and for all of her help within the study as well as all the other contributors towards this project. As you can see, it's been a very big project and I could no way have done it on my own.
Um, I'd also like to thank the British Army for uh, providing funding for the research and the Physiological Society for allowing me to present today. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Wonderful presentation on this very important problem uh, that we still don't know the answers to. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, I think we'll carry on then with the next presentation, uh, which is titled Variation in the Vascular Response of Animals to a Thermal Challenge by Claire Eglin, Lisa Martin, Frank Golden, and Mike Tipton from the University of Portsmouth. The presentation will be given by Dr. Claire Eglin. Hello and thank you very much and following on from Jen's very nice presentation I'm going to be continuing to talk about non-freezing cold injury and um, this time I'm looking at the um, an animal model of non-freezing cold injury. Next slide please. As we've already heard non-freezing cold injury is caused by prolonged exposure to cold and often wet conditions and in humans this mainly affects the hands and feet and um, the most common symptoms are reported are persistent pain and cold sensitivity. And as we've already heard from Jen, there's a wide variation in the responses of patients with non-freezing cold injury. Um, and this might be in part due to the fact that um, the injurious cold exposure could be very variable, not only in the severity, but also in the duration of that cold exposure, as well as the confounding factors that might also be present, such as um, hypoxia, um, dehydration, tight fitting clothing, the existence of injuries um, or illnesses at the same time. And so these might all contribute to the variability of the injury and therefore of the responses that we see of the patients. Therefore, there's really a need for an animal model of non-freezing cold injury, which enables us to standardize the injurious cold exposure and therefore enables us to examine the pathophysiology of non-freezing cold injury in more detail. Next slide, please. So there's been various models of um, non-freezing cold injury. Those have included isolated uh, nerve fibers, um, the rabbit hind limb, um, hamster um, pouch, and also the rat tail. Now it's the rat tail that we decided to investigate further because it has an abundance of arteriovenous venous anastomoses and is therefore a thermoregulatory organ. And so it is very similar to the fingers and toes of humans, which are affected particularly by non-freezing cold injury. Another important consideration is that there's easy access to the rat tail. So next slide, please. Um, next, please. So this is our experimental setup. We used adult male Worcester rats, and you can see um, in the diagram there, they were held in a tube. Um, there was a, a jacket around them that could be perfused with different temperature water to either cool them or warm them up, and their tail was immersed in water. Next, please. So the animals were progressively habituated to both the restraint and monitoring and also tail immersion. And this took approximately three weeks. And at the end of this, the animals were showing their normal behavior, both grooming and eating throughout. Next, please. The measurements we took were um, body temperature, and this was from a subcutaneous implant on the scruff of the neck. And we also measured tail temperature, both proximally and distally, as well as um, looking, making sure that the air temperature, water temperature and the jacket temperature were kept constant. Next, please. So um, the protocol was followed. Next, please. Sorry. So this was the protocol that we used um, following that habituation period. The animals then undertook three cold sensitivity tests, which I'll describe in a moment. Those were taken about two days apart. Following this, they then underwent the cold inducing, cold injury inducing exposure, which again I'll explain in a moment. Following that, they then um, had cold sensitivity tests weekly and then fortnightly to look at the progression of their um, recovery from that cold exposure. Next, please. So this was the injurious cold exposure that um, they undertook following instrumentation. They had a period of rest for 15 minutes in 21 degree air. Their tail was then immersed in thermoneutral water at 28 degrees for 20 minutes. 
During this time, the jacket was cooled slightly, and this was to prevent any cold-induced vasodilatation during the subsequent cooling period. The water was then slowly cooled down to one degrees there, and then maintained there for three hours. At the end of this, the tail was removed from the water, dried, and the jacket perfusion was stopped. And then they were allowed to spontaneously rewarm for um, in 20 degree air. Following that, they were then returned to their cages. And there was no overt sign of cold injury following this um, cold exposure. Next, please. So the cold sensitivity test was fairly similar to that described by Jen in the previous um, presentation. So following instrumentation, again, the animals underwent a period of um, stabilization, both in 21 degree air and in, with their tail in thermoneutral water. The water was then cooled to 15 degrees at a rate of one degree per minute down um, and kept at 15 degrees for two to three minutes. Again, the tail was then removed, dried, and then spontaneously rewarming was allowed. And throughout all of this um, protocol, the animals didn't show any sign of distress and displayed their normal behavior of grooming and feeding throughout. Next, please. So this figure shows the response of a single animal to that cold sensitivity test prior to the injurious cold exposure. And we can see in the yellow line there, that is the body temperature, which remained fairly constant. The blue line is the distal tail temperature. And we can see that um, as the water temperature cooled, the tail temperature cooled. And then following removal from the water, we can see that the tail temperature starts to increase. And then we can see a rapid increase as um, the onset of vasodilatation occurs. And this time to vasodilate was our major outcome measure. Next, please. And this is the response of that same rat um, following that cold injury um, exposure. And we can see that the rate of rewarming is much slower. And in this particular animal that we didn't see um, the onset of vasodilation during the experimental period. Next, please. If we look at the group data now, so this is um, the time to vasodilate, both pre-injury and post-injury, we can see that there's a wide range in variability, uh, both before the injury and following the injury. And in five of the six animals, we saw an increase in the time to vasodilate. Interestingly, if we look at those blue lines, those are litter mates. And we see even though they are um, very similar genetically, we find that there's still individual variability. What I'm going to show in the next few slides is the measures that we um, undertook, the alterations in the protocol that we undertook to try and reduce this level of variability. So next please. So we modified both the cold exposure and the cold sensitivity test in the next few slides to try and reduce this variability. So in the first experiment, we um, altered the cold exposure such that instead of having um, a three hour period of um, immersion, this was reduced to two um, lots of one and a half hours or three lots of one hour exposure, as it is thought that the repeated exposure might be more injurious. In addition, the cold sensitivity test was changed to um, increase the immersion in 15 degree water to 10 minutes. And what we can see here is the individual responses to each of the rats, um, both pre-injury and post-injury. And prior to injury, we can see that there's um, a lot of individual variation, and this is continued after the injury as well. Next, please. So in the next iteration of this um, experiment, we look to see if there was a difference in the response um, just because the animal is aging or that it's becoming more familiar with the handling. And so we undertook a sham exposure by immersing the tail in 28 degrees water. And again, we can see that um, this probably isn't the case as although there's a lot of variability, we didn't see um, a large increase in the time to vasodilate following the sham exposure. Next, please. So in this next modification, um, what we looked at was trying to um, simulate more the situation seen in human patients where the, their non-freezing cold injury is likely to be 
um, can occur um, alongside mild hypothermia. So in this case, during that cold exposure, the jacket was cooled to one degree Celsius. Um, and this was partially successful. However, again, we're still seeing this individual variability. Next slide, please. So in this final attempt, we reverted back our cold exposure to um, just that single three hour um, cold exposure with the jacket cooled to one degrees. And our cold sensitivity test, um, we warmed the jacket up to 33 degrees. And this was to um, try and remove any central vasoconstrictor tone that might be altering the response. And so therefore, this is very similar to the cold sensitivity test that Jen described. And this seemed to be successful in reducing the variability seen um, prior to the injury. However, again, we're still seeing considerable variation following the injurious cold exposure. Next, please. So in conclusion then, we managed to reduce the variability in the time to vasodilate um, before the injury occurred in the, in the cold sensitivity test. And this was probably because of tighter control of body temperature. However, there was still intra and inter variability present. Following the cold exposure, there was a large variability in the response. Um, despite the tight experimental control that was undertaken, both in the environment, the testing procedure, and the fact that we were using purebred Worcester rats. Next, please. I'd like to acknowledge particularly Frank Golden's involvement in this um, project. He was instrumental in running the studies and getting the whole project up together, as well as Lisa Martin, who was um, involved throughout all of the testing. I'd also like to thank the involvement of Robert Inns and David Late in the project. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, great presentation. Uh, and that concludes our session on temperature regulation. We have some time now for questions. And uh, I will, uh, there are a couple uh, here that I'll read. One is from Thad Wilson. Uh, this is probably for, uh, for Jennifer. Was the human toe skin the pad, nail bed, or dorsal aspect? There could be neural and vascular differences between these locations. So perhaps. Jennifer, if you can address this, please. Yeah, so we were very much aware of how the individual locations can differ. And now we've we standardized both the um, skin temperature measure as well as the skin surface blood flow measure to the pad of the great toe. So that's where we collect the analyses from. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and a question for Claire. Um, I'm, uh, the core temperature, uh, obviously you were trying to prevent hypothermia during this experiment. Um, and uh, did you have problems with, with maintaining body temperature? That's my first question. The second question is, uh, over the, as I'm not an animal physiologist, but I understand that the rat tail actually changes uh, uh, over with, with aging. So if you have a young uh, rat or an uh, older rat, as you had, the tail uh, is comprised of I should say different proportions of tissue. Does this have any effect on, on how the, on the responses? Um, so just trying to remember um, your question. So I'll have to answer the second question because I can remember that one. Um, so does it uh, does the rat tail uh, change over time? Well, hopefully we try to um, account for that by that sham experiment so that um, we looked at immersing the tail in thermoneutral water. And um, we didn't see, although there was still that variation in response, it, um, we didn't see the large sort of increase in time to vasotilitate that we saw with the cold, the, um, cold exposure. So I think that's probably one of the fewer things that were affecting um, the variability. Um, the other question you answered asked about was uh, maintaining um, core temperature. So because we had the jacket around the um, animal, we were able to alter that. And so to maintain a fairly consistent um, core temperature. There. Myself, during the cold exposure, I didn't see any core temperature or I may, may have missed it. Uh, so you exposed, you, you actually reduced the jacket's water temperature, correct? 
So this may have affected the core temperature. In your uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I was talking about during the cold sensitivity test. Um, uh, the core temperature, I believe, was um, reduced slightly, but um, only to um, suppress cold induced vasodilatation. So the body temperature was within the sort of normal range. Okay. Thank you very much to both our speakers. Um, I will now, uh, I'd like to now invite you to the um, uh, networking session. So this is, uh, this is something new also for me, <laughs> but what will happen is when I say, uh, when I give Rosie the go ahead, she will actually paste a link in the chat section and uh, that link uh, will then be there for about 10 seconds or so. And so I would like to invite you then to go to this new link, if you like, for the networking session. And when we're there um, as a group, then uh, Rosie will establish several breakout rooms of five or more individuals. And in these breakout sessions, uh, it's basically to um, discuss the issues that were raised and perhaps uh, um, I'm supposed to provide some, some, some ice-breaking ice questions, uh, but my questions to you as, as a group would be, um, uh, if, if this, this is going to probably evolve into a workshop next year, uh, a year from now actually, if all things go well, and uh, we'd like to ask what would you like to see uh, in this workshop? We envisage it as a workshop where you would bring your data to a group uh, with statisticians, mathematicians present and try to uh, look at your data from the point of view of individual variability. So would this be something of interest and would you be uh, interesting, interested in participating in something like that? And of course, uh, we'd also like to know if this has helped you in your research or uh, can you provide perhaps in the next year some other examples uh, that would be of interest to, to our members, if you like. So these are the issues I'd like you to maybe discuss and we'll bring them, we'll bring your ideas and comments flow back to, to, the, to the group. Um, and again, I'd like to, before we disappear, I'd like to just uh, invite you to attend tomorrow's meeting, which starts at the same time. And uh, many, there are many questions of statistical nature. Those will be addressed tomorrow in the final specialist session. So we will look at those questions and they will be addressed, but that will be tomorrow. So I invite you to attend that tomorrow. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for, to the presenters for a wonderful morning of presentations and uh, also to the attendees for, for participating in this. And the link for the networking session is now posted in the chat section. So if you'd like to please click on that, you'll be, uh, then transferred to the networking, networking session. Thank you. On behalf of myself and Mike Tipton, uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Bye.